You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. Throughout the 1930s and 40s, there was a Christian um, and Swiss physician and author by the name of Paul Tournier. And he had acquired in the 30s and 40s and since then a wide audience, a wide following of uh, people that looked to him for his uh, advice or in many ways his uh, act as a father of what is called modern day pastoral counseling. For many, Paul Tournier's ideas had a significant impact on the way that psychosocial medical stuff got integrated with the Christian or spiritual aspects of the Christian faith. And it became part of routine patient care at that time for all. Paul was even once called uh, the 20th century's most famous Christian physician. Once he was being interviewed in in a writing about Uh, What set him apart? And he said that my patients often say to me, I admire the patience by which you listen to everything uh, that I tell you. By the way, let's just admit, those of us who have to see the doctor more regularly than we'd like, it makes a difference when your physician is willing to actually care about who you are, right? When they actually stop and ask you things. I am thankful for that with my uh, family doctor. When I'm in for a diabetic check, he's asking about the whole family. He's talking about things. It's not just this cold shorter, right? And, and Paul Tournier was known for his caring hospitality. In response to this, you know, patience that he seems to have, he said, it's not at all patience. It's not patience at all, but it's interest. I love that line. It would be a fun conversation. What is the difference between patience and interest? So I assume we can have interest in a person, but not patience with that person. Paul says what keeps him patient with the patience is what keeps him full, is that he's fully invested into their conversations. It's a a genuine interest for him. Now, there are some struggles in my life, at times, to stay patient in a conversation. You guys ever have those moments? There are times after lunch where I'm meeting with a guest who is telling me the same story he has told me 10 times before over the past 10 weeks that I start to hug and nurse my coffee because if I don't, I'm going to start to do this, right? We all struggle at times to stay present. And perhaps it's because we haven't found a way to stay generally interested in someone. Jesus models that same sense of caring, that same sense of interest or genuine interest in people in the story that we are going to look at today in Mark. Mark shows a Jesus who cares about or takes interest in our everyday life and troubles. There's a theologian by the name of William Barclay that says, a miracle to Jesus, and we will see a miracle in today's story, A miracle to Jesus was not just a means of increasing his prestige. It was not just to help in a, a laborious and disagreeable duty. He helped instinctively because he was supremely interested in all who needed his help. We see that that idea of interest again. Miracles are everyday helps, encouragements even, that Jesus does in the life of those that he loves because he instinctively has interest in them. Last week we started our new summer series, The Time Has Come. And this series follows the life, the ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus through the narrative of Mark. Mark, as we saw last week, is the shortest gospel, and it's also the gospel that uniquely focuses on the humanity and the actions of Jesus. 
through Mark, he portrays insights into the actions of Jesus that some of the other gospel writers doesn't. And he does so in a way that beautifully illustrates or illuminates God's humanity, his heart, and his character. This series through Mark, I believe, will be one that helps us to study the scriptures, to learn how to follow, and to live and love like Jesus. In Mark, the only narrative, uh, by the way, as we saw last week, the only narrative on the life and ministry of Jesus to actually call itself a gospel, time and time again, shows the way that God's goodness, his good news, breaks into the moment, into the present day, to bring about deliverance, healing, liberation, restoration, and compassion. And, and really, that those things are making a difference now, today. And Mark starts his collection of stories with Jesus proclaiming that the good news of God, and he's embodying and he's demonstrating, he's announcing it, that the time has come and that the kingdom of God is near, and that we are to repent and believe the good news. From that point of Jesus proclaiming that in Mark's gospel, he starts to show the way that that statement comes true in the places that we live, work, and play. Mark wants us to grasp who Jesus is, And our response to it is to repent and to do the same things, to repent by believing and then uh, to realize what overflows through that response is a life full of the Holy Spirit. Mark captures this so that we too can have a life of the Spirit, just as Jesus did. In essence, Mark is helping us to know what it means to partner with the Holy Spirit to bring healing and peace to the places that we live, work, and play. We also had a chance, by the way, to look a little bit at who Mark was last week, the life and the ministry of of his story. It started at Peter's side, and then it went to Luke's side, and then he stood time at the the side of of Paul and Barabbas. We also saw uh, that he might have been a streaker, uh, and it was a a fun look at the story of Mark. If you didn't hear that story, then uh, go back and listen to the first series, the first Sunday of this series and you'll learn more about the person of Mark. Throughout this series, I've been inviting you to follow along as we read the Gospel of Mark, as you uh, individually and as we communally read the book of Mark together. I believe God will show up and show off to encourage us and challenge us in many ways. And I believe that wherever we agree in in a vision or a mission, wherever there's two or three that are gathered, God will show up and teach us something new as a church community. Next week, let me just say, we're taking a break from Mark. It gives you time to catch up or go on ahead. And Kevin is going to be speaking uh, on that morning message. And so I'm very excited uh, to hear from him. But this morning we're going to be looking at Mark 1, 29 through 34. It's the next story, the story that follows immediately the story that we looked at last week. We find this smaller story. I call it an in-between story. There's dramatic story, little story. And dramatic story, and this one gets wedged in there, and if we're not careful, we can miss it, we can overlook at it. And, and last week, we remember that we looked at this story of a man who was demon-possessed, and this morning we're going to be looking at something else, but that demon idea is going to come up again at the end of this passage. As I said this morning, we'll be looking at this less dramatic story of Jesus, Mark 1, 29-34, if you've been part of the Chosen series. This actually was in the season one, episode three. Uh, you, you would have seen it. And as we read, and I'm going to read it in just one second, but as we read, I want you to pay attention to where in this passage did you find the Holy Spirit grabbing your attention through a word, through a phrase, an idea, or an image, right? Perhaps it's something that as we read it encourages you, or it challenges you, or even brings up question for you. And after I read it, we're going to pause, and I'm going to give you a chance to, to talk about that. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So they went to her. They took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her. She began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Let me just say, in this story, we certainly see that Jesus illustrates, or Mark illustrates, how Jesus is modeling God's heart, his humanity, his character, to those that are simply in their places of work, living and playing. 
Right? Mark starts with Jesus finding his disciples where? At work. He calls them as they're fishing. Then he goes into their place of play. He goes into their place of worship. And now he's in their home. Right? This isn't a ministry of stadiums and megachurches. It's in the middle of the midst of everyday life. We also see yet another example how Jesus is declaring the time has come as with simple authority he embodies, demonstrates, and announces God's deliverance, his healing, his liberation, his restoration, his compassion in the here and the now. Now, as we read that story, I'm curious, what stood out to you? Was there a part of this that stood out to you, encouraged you, challenged you, or just seemed like an area you'd want to know more about? I agree. It's a beautiful image of Jesus. And Mark uniquely shares that, the, the intimate touch of Jesus. Some time ago, I guess over Easter, I read a blog that they proved about the fact that the surprise of the, of the resurrection, these people didn't expect a resurrection. And I think we have potential for a big surprise here. Yeah. And a lot of these people were surprised and they Word got out mm-hmm. quickly to the neighborhood and a lot of people came. Yeah. I think we read these stories and don't recognize the surprise, but we have to have the all. It is sad how easily stories become familiar to us. Yeah. Stu. About how she got up and started serving right away. Mm. Are there any mother-in-laws that are not a strong personality? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Don't answer that question. <laughs> but her and I are the two strongest personalities in the family. So that can be a little challenging, but, but she's a real blessing, too, you know. I'll, I'll tell you one thing about my mother-in-law. When we were first married, she said, we need more extroverts in the family. Now, four kids later, I don't know if she's still... <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Anyone else want to share something that stood out to him? Go ahead. I think it's just, it's just hard to heal the entire town. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's hard to always see who's there. Yeah. You know, it's not to shame them and tell them they're all terrible. It's like it's just like it's for children or whatever. It's just like they should be. Yeah. Yeah, there's a sense of love, not judgment at play, right? And they're surrendered. They believe what he can do, and it allows him to, to do some cool stuff. Mark tells us that this story followed immediately after Jesus left the synagogue. Right? And so it's Sabbath. And we get this idea that as this story follows, Jesus has uh, just claimed his, his authority, his power over the unseen world. And he then decides he's going to spend the time of rest with his friends. Right? He goes to the home of his disciples. And I'm sure that in a passive-aggressive way, as everyone left that synagogue where this crazy thing just happened, and they're not supposed to work, they're not supposed to do much, spend a lot of energy, they're just supposed to walk home and rest for Shabbat, right? I'm sure there were quiet whispers, oh my word, look, he's walking with those two fishermen, right? Oh my word, they're going to his house. Did you see what he did, right? There was this passive-aggressive gossip that began to spread throughout the galleon of villages that were very close in his day. And we certainly saw this last week that Jesus showed that he had this authority that caused a shock uh, on the news of Jesus' ministry. And it does, we lose that shock sometimes. And what caused the shock in the next story here, what we just looked at, isn't one of such grandeur. There's not a guy in the middle of a seizure yelling out demonic things in the middle of a church service. There's no hype. There's pure simplicity. Not, Not confidence but authority. So after leaving this high moment of ministry, Jesus withdraws to the home of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, two of the Galilean fishermen who were his earliest followers. Now, Mark's narrative said that he was going with four fishermen. They're kind of ragtag dudes at this time, right? James and John. And they're going to the house of Andrew and Simon, Peter, right after the synagogue. After 
synagogue, it was common to go and spend a, a Shabbat meal, a Sabbath meal, uh, in the sixth hour, which would have been about 12 noon. And I don't know about you, but growing up after church, our family would go home, we'd have a really big meal, we'd take a nap. I never wanted to take a nap on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, now I can't stop from taking a nap. Uh, but then for dinner, we wouldn't have a big dinner. We would just pick, right, and, or have leftovers. Did you guys do that growing up with Sunday sometimes? That is common in this era for the synagogue as well. But the best part was you didn't get to do the dishes afterwards because you weren't allowed to do the dishes afterwards. And so you got to eat, take a nap, and not do dishes. That sounds like a great uh, afternoon. From the short introduction of the story, though, we see that they're going together to Simon, Peter, and Andrew's childhood home. Doesn't it sound crazy that these two guys are still living at home, even though Peter is married, and he's got his mother-in-law in the house as well, right, all under one roof? Such an idea is foreign from our American custom and thought. Even worse, It's Sabbath, and so you can't send Andrew and Simon to the attic or to the basement to get another extension for the table, right, and get some folding chairs. That's how it was at my grandparents' house all the time. That that was considered work, and so uh, the house couldn't be swept to prepare yourself. When you're coming over for a Shabbat meal, last minute, you get what you get, and you don't get upset. And it was time, and this time it was common for people, And this is perhaps what was going on for Simon Peter and his wife. It was common for them to live with a husband's family for a season. That season was meant to give the couple a time to save money, to be able to prepare themselves to to move out and to have a great start in life. Looking back, I should have done something like that, right? I moved out two weeks after graduating high school at 18. I was not ready for the world. Uh, but there's something beautiful about this uh, investment in the next generation. That, and it certainly would have led to a crowded home, having Peter and his wife and his mother-in-law in the home. It also may have been that Andrew and Peter's mom and father were no longer living. The lifespan of adults was especially short in the Galilean villages at this time. And, and parents of individuals often died when the kids were just young adults. And some have suspected that Simon and Peter probably outlived their parents, and they're still now living in the home. They've taken over the home. Uh, Peter is probably the oldest, and he's the man of the household now. And Simon, Peter, and Andrew then are still at home. We have Simon, Peter, and his wife there at home. Uh, but we also get that... Uh, The mother-in-law is there, and we assume that the father-in-law has passed away, and it falls on the oldest to care for uh, Peter's wife's mom. And responsibility at this time often fell on the oldest. It was uh, not only important to give the next generation that was emerging a fresh, healthy start, but it was important for them to care for their family, their extended family, when they needed a healthy and compassionate sense of care. In fact, at this time, if you endured a debt while you were still at home, it was your dad's responsibility to cover it for the sake of the family's name. I'm not suggesting that is a, that's called enabling in today's time. But in this story, Jesus is sharing and modeling that same compassionate care for an aging family member. He cares for the young and the old, for every day the marginalized, and he does that time and time again throughout Mark's gospel. The miracle of healing Peter's mother-in-law in the home makes this miracle often called by many a domestic uh, miracle. And they call it that because, especially in Mark's story, we get a snapshot into the everyday lives of Jesus' followers, the apostles. We get a, a glimpse in their domestic lives. From the start of Mark, we get a view where they live, where they worship, and now where they play. And it's about an everyday life as you can get. It's not prestigious. Yet, this local ministry that Jesus does here and begins here will transform the world. We learn that Simon Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. And some suggest that she could have been suffering from something they called at the time uh, the burning fever. Now, I'm not quite sure what that is, but just by the name on it alone, uh, not signing up to find out what it is either. But they had remedies for it. People at this time had become very superstitious. 
And so they had a book called the Talmud, and in it were writings of rabbis on how to heal uh, certain boils and skin infections. And it often you know, had certain verses you'd have to read, certain prayers you'd have to say. But sometimes it had more, let's call it, uh, creative solutions that we would probably label as new agey and really weird. And they had something in there called the burning fever. And they had weird and unsuccessful ways of dealing with it. You were supposed to crawl into the woods and carve something into a tree, turn a knife so many times, and then hang it with a lock of your hair from the tree. Really weird, superstitious stuff. In other words, it was a bad disease they had really no cure for. Others have suggested that this might have been more of a terminal fever, like the Malta fever or typhoid or malaria. And Luke, in his story... Luke's a doctor, so he adds a description for it. He calls it a great fever. And and the word he uses for great means that it greatly affected you, or it was a deep-rooted disease in the person. And so it was no small thing. Jesus chooses, the Messiah chooses to come home to eat at the house of a sickly person who would have been considered unclean at this time. Uh, Nevertheless, it's someone who's easily overlooked. He could have made himself sick, but he chooses there to spend his Shabbat. Jesus shows that caring for people in our everyday lives and our everyday relationships with others. He cares to be with Andrew and with Simon Peter, and he cares to be with Peter's wife. He cares to be even with this strained relationship with a sick mother-in-law. Take note. Jesus cares for us when our loved ones are sick too. We must see that Jesus is so on who longs for us to bring our concerns to. And often, it's easy for us to bring the big concerns and think the little concerns are of no significance, that it's something we just have to plow through or deal with or try to control our things. This fever is bad, but it's not one of the big things. It's not a stroke or cancer or uh, something that probably would lead to immediate death. It's probably closer to a cold in their time. And Jesus cares about that. Later on, Jesus will say, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus demonstrates that care right here. He invites himself in, and he holds that lady's hand, as Rhoda pointed out, and he invites her to experience that sense of healing and rest. And Peter, who's at the center of this story, right? Peter's watching his mother-in-law being saved, and maybe he's like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Like, we don't know, right? Uh, And Peter is watching this, and I just think it's funny because he sees Jesus act in a great humbling way, And later, when he's writing to his disciples and to his churches in 1 Peter 5, 7, he tells them to humble themselves and to cast all their anxiety on him because he cares for you. Peter can say this to his readers because he's seen it in his life. He's seen it firsthand. Sometimes we give Jesus our big concerns and we harbor our little everyday concerns. Jesus cares even about our little things. He cares about our faith in a synagogue. He cares about our everyday lives and relationships and the places that we live, work, and play. And so in this story, perhaps we ask, what are you holding back from him? The text says that they told Jesus about this sickness. Perhaps they were warning him, you may not want to come over to our house. Man, my mother-in-law is like normally cranky, but she's extra cranky now because that lady has got the burning fever. And let me tell you, she is burning. Right? And so he's trying to warn him, but Jesus doesn't get steered away from that. He shows concern. What are you holding back from him that you feel is insignificant? The moment in which Jesus pours out his compassion and his healing on someone and does it on a day of rest, right? Or Orthodox Judaism at this time uh, would have said, you could heal on this day if you had the gift of healing only if it was a life or death situation. Anything else was considered work. In Mark's gospel, we get no evidence that this is a life or death situation. Jesus knew that the greatest rest that someone could experience was restoration to a life that was abundant. 
which brings the day of, which was really what the day of rest was all about, to experience God's abundance. On this day of rest and restoration, Jesus brings God's restoration to Peter's mother-in-law in the here and the now. He takes interest in people that's bigger than their traditions, their customs, and their laws. And he shows a genuine interest in them by grabbing her hand. I agree. I don't think, as Rhoda said, there is any more healing or intimate way than just to to grab somebody's hand when you're talking with them. Often at work when I'm talking with somebody that's distraught, I'll put my hand on their shoulder or on their elbow so that they know that I am there being present with them. And in this story, it's simply by grabbing a hand and looking into her eyes and helping her just to her feet, that she experiences healing. The simple and authoritative way Jesus chooses to bring about God's healing or restoration to this woman that was imprisoned by her condition. It tells us that small moments, ordinary moments, can be divinely transformative, full of otherworldly moments, full of God's healing and liberation, when we're simply willing to be present, to take interest, to care, and to have a compassionate interest. Now, in that, mother, uh, in that moment, Simon Peter's mother-in-law is liberated from her condition. And as she's liberated, as she becomes aware of it, the consciousness of it, it overwhelms her with a sense of gratitude. It, she sits up, she begins to serve Jesus. And that's, that's quite an image. 360, right? Jesus will often work something miraculous in our lifetime. And I think it often happens when we first start following him. This sense comes over us that we've been liberated or forgiven or free. And in that moment, it does something to us. And that's exactly what Peter's mother-in-law is experiencing here. She feels that she's been transformed now to be part of God's transformation in others. She's been freed up to free others. She's been healed to be part of God's healing in others. And what happens is her healing brought out devotion and obedience. And she models that now for followers of Jesus. Now just let that sink in for a minute. Mark's gospel, his narrative on the life and ministry of Jesus, the first example of what it really means to be a disciple, he just says that the men followed him, but here it shows the first disciple that knows what it means to live and love like Jesus, to to follow after him, is through the lens of a woman who's elderly, who's sick, and who has lost all things by by the standard of the world. That's who he chooses to show obedience for. That means there's hope for each one of us here, that we, we too can live a life that is obedient, that models for others what it means to follow Jesus. She turns around and serves Everyone at the table serves. She teaches them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In fact, at this time, a strict rabbi probably wouldn't have let a woman in a room, nevertheless served the men at the table. And Mark makes it clear that Jesus is different, and we need to get used to different. We cannot take miss, by the way, that this healing takes place where? It's in a home. It's in part of our everyday life. And, and this might be why Jesus doesn't get in trouble for healing on the Sabbath, but it also shows us that he's willing to be who he is inside the private of our, his home uh, when no one else is noticing. He, he doesn't just care about the crowds. He seemingly, though, in this story, prioritizes everyday people in a small town. Most of who was in Galilee were fishermen. They were lower to blue crowd. Uh, Collar workers, and Jesus wasn't only invested in a public square on the hillsides and in town squares, but he was a person of humility. He was bringing about God's deliverance, his healing, his liberation, his restoration, and his compassion into the places where people live, work, and play. And he was showing how it could make a difference here and now. Mark closes the story by saying that the other sick didn't just Come, but they came to the door as soon as evening ended, which tells us they were itching at their homes for Shabbat to end. Remember, Shabbat would have ended in the evening uh, around six, and so they had just run over to this house, and it would had violated Shabbat law to carry someone, even if that someone was sick. And so they they were resting away, waiting for the moment where they could too encounter this Jesus. Rest away from crowds is important. Jesus models that. However, healing is more important than anything. 
A sunset came, the new day starts for the Jewish schedule, and Mark tells us that the whole town, perhaps more figuratively than literally, began to gather at the door of Simon, Peter, and Andrew. I have two doors in my home that go outside. You may have two, you may have more, Uh, but this was in a day before fire coats. Sorry, Bob, there were no fire coats in this day, and most homes only were happy enough to have one home. Now, They also just led into a big open room. There usually wasn't too many uh, off-the-side bedrooms. People could just afford to have one big space. Could you just imagine? We got Jesus, Peter, Peter's wife, Peter's mom, all right, uh, mother-in-law. We got James. We got John, right? We have uh, probably a couple other people. And now the whole town seems to be coming out uh, why we're at it. Now, if our main entrance here, if this main worship space was a home in the Galilean region, and that door to my right was the main door, uh, that door would lead out onto a main street or into a courtyard on other homes, and, and that would have been the only way in and the only way out. At this time, Cavernum probably had about 1,500 people in it. The town of Conestoga, not the Conestoga region, but just the town of Conestoga. Uh, It's been declining at 2.23% a year, not sure why, but right now in 2023, we have 1,113 people living in downtown Conestoga. So just a little over 1,000 people. So we could relate to Capernaum. Just imagine as soon as our worship together ended, that door opened, we're getting ready to leave, and there's the whole town of Conestoga waiting to get in here. It would be especially overwhelming for the introverts in this room. Who's with me, right? That would have been a struggle for some of you, right? Jesus is uh, worse, not just attracting a town, but he's attracting all the town's sick, all the town's people that are demonically and mentally off, right? He's attracting people with communicable diseases and with great areas of brokenness. And not only are we opening the door and finding the whole town, we're finding the town's weirdos at the door, right? I mean, it would have been greatly overwhelming. Literally, those who are sick and possessed are coming to their home. I must believe, though, that it's just as possible in today's time as it was in Jesus. We know in small towns Both good news and bad news travels fast. And that was happening in Jesus' time. Jesus' ministry and authority was new. It was life-giving. The town saw something different embodied. They saw something demonstrated and announced in Jesus' ministry. They saw God's deliverance, his healing, his liberation, his restoration, his compassion in a way that made a difference here and now. I like to say that Jesus didn't just have a message of heaven, as we often do but of a heaven that was making a difference in their everyday lives. In this story, Jesus certainly illustrates God's humanity, his heart, his character to those who are simply existing in the places that they live, work, and play. He does so even every day by going to worship, by going home, by hanging out with the fishermen at work. And what we see is Jesus' ministry, and through Jesus' ministry to the neighborhood, is the way that the overflow of the home can transform a neighborhood. So as the sick and the hurting come to the door, the demonic forces at play get triggered up as he cares for them. But he shows that authority that he showed last week once more, that authority, that simple authority over them. He doesn't even allow them to speak. He's walking with intimacy in God in such a way, it says that they have no power in his presence. Jesus is about as a no-hype ministry as you can get. It's unlike most spirit-filled pastors that we would see on TV or in churches today. Early on in Mark's gospel that we see an unseen world, and we see the marginalized to see Jesus much quicker as who he is than anyone else, the religious leaders, the centers, or even his followers. In this story, we see another example of how Jesus is declaring the time has come. And he does that by simply taking interest in somebody who would have been lost in the margins of life. Mark's account of this story says, as the evening came, which means as the new day came, evening was the start of a new day, you and I are started 
to be invited now into that new day. A new day where every aspect of life is special. Despite a messy house that you may have, otherworldly things may happen there. We see a Jesus who models a care for the young and the old, the overlooked and the marginalized. And the humble ways, he shows genuine, compassionate interest. There's no hype, no prestige, no show. And Jesus models for us what it means to follow him, to enter the home of those who are sick and forgotten and who take interest. We are reminded that Jesus cares about everyday lives, even the little things like colds and strained relationships. Jesus models different for us. That tells us that River Corner Church, we're not too big, we're not too small to take part in meaningful ministry. In fact, the kind of ministry Jesus focused on was in a small synagogue with a bunch of everyday people in a small town about the size of this. You and I should take hope that otherworldly things, supernatural things can happen when we allow the Holy Spirit to interrupt us in the busyness of our day and teach us to be present with somebody easily overlooked, what healing might come about if we were willing to just stop and see somebody that was hurting in the places that you live, work, play, eat, worship, touch their shoulder, hold their hand, touch their their elbow, look them in the eyes, and bring about God's goodness and good news. We need to have a message that heaven awaits for those who follow him. But that message of heaven also makes a difference today. And it can be done simply by showing interest.